thought I would share a couple of thoughts. No particular word this time, just a couple of thoughts that struck me today. Uh, I was listening to my um, dram dramatized version of the Bible today on my way home. I was listening to the book of Mark and I, I oftentimes listen to uh, Mark and Luke and John because I, and Acts because I'm, I'm studying the way Jesus and the disciples handled the ministry opportunities, the miracles, the healings, the casting out of demons. Uh, I'm looking at things like what made them come out and uh, what situation contributed to uh, the, them being in that condition in the first place. So I'm just doing, you know, I'm doing research. I call it opposition research because, you know, the enemy, he, he is my opposition and we are at war. And I'm doing my opposition research. I'm trying to figure out his strategy. And the word, scripture tells us that the script, the Bible tells us that the scriptures are good for uh, doctrine, reproof, instruction, and in righteousness. And I uh, can't even remember the last one, but y'all get the point. But as I'm listening to Jesus doing all these wonderful miracles, something occurs to me. And that is, oftentimes, when you have a ministry of healing or deliverance or prophecy, or when you dare to believe that the gifts in 1 Corinthians 12 uh, did not cease, but in fact are uh, still very much a part of uh, what Jesus is doing in the earth, when, 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 you, when you believe these kind of things, you run into opposition. You run into people who, who want to try to convince you that, you know, you, the gifts don't need, aren't needed anymore. And they, and they say some of the silliest things. Uh, you know, when it comes to healing, people try to challenge the validity of healing by saying we have doctors now. And I just think that is the absolute craziest thing in the world because... While we have doctors, doctors are not known for healing. They're not known for fixing the situation. And in this particular time period, a lot of doctors have taken the approach of prescribing medication. To such a degree, we have an opioid problem from the overprescription of medication. Because that has become the norm. Any problem we have, there is something that we can take for it. Now, medication is a wonderful thing. Doctors are a wonderful thing. Jesus does not um, denounce, uh, you know, doctors. Uh, a lot of people have come to believe that medicine is door openers for demons because of the side effects, which really side effects are demons responding to being attacked um, in some cases. But some of those things you have suicidal thoughts and all you're trying to do is get a skin rash just because there's something there trying to that perceives your medication as an attack. I believe it is a, a, a medication is a good thing and we should use medication. Um, and doctors are good things because if we look at the woman with the issue of blood, the doctors kept her alive long enough to be what healed because this was the second time Jesus had come. Maybe her, why didn't she come the first time? Maybe her faith wasn't ready. Maybe she hadn't become desperate enough. Maybe she wasn't tired enough. And so maybe she had become really tired by the time Jesus came, exhausted all of her money, the Bible says, spent up everything, trying to get the problem resolved. And the doctors kept her alive, but they couldn't get her healed. And so Jesus comes along. So doctors have value. Medicine has value. Oftentimes, doctors and medicine help us to live with a condition. Now, that's your choice. You know, some people want to live with the condition. And some people want to be rid of the condition. Jesus teaches us that if we wait long, if, 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 under the right circumstances, he gets rid of the condition. He gave us gifts of healing so that we can get rid of the situation. He tells us in James that anyone sick among you, let, among you, let him call for the elders and let them anoint him with oil and let them pray a prayer of faith. And it tells them, and he will be healed. So it's very clear 
that a God's ultimate goal is not that we le learn how to live with our issues, but that we learn how to live with them long enough to be ultimately healed, because that is his ultimate goal. But there are a lot of people who just don't believe that healing is necessary. They don't believe healing is necessary. They don't believe it's for today. And again, they use these stupid things. They like to say that we have doctors now, we have psychiatrists now, but none of those things deal with the issues, other issues such as demons. What do we do with demons? The demons disappear because we got medicine. The demons disappear because uh, we got more knowledge. Absolutely not. Absolutely not. They are still around, still present, and people are still being tormented. And if you listen to me any amount of times, I've proven to you over and over and over and over again in the scriptures that a lot of times they're found in the tormenting uh, diseases that we are dealing with. Tormenting diseases, tormenting addictions, anything that is involving torment and things by, whereby you cannot gain control of your life. That's because they are involved in some way. So a lot of times when you believe these things, people choose to uh, choose to want to believe that somehow you are operating in some level of heresy or you have misinterpreted scriptures somehow. I mean, they just go into all kinds of things. If you believe in prophecy, people like to, you know, say all kinds of foolish things. It's just all kinds of foolishness. Uh, you don't need the Bible in God. We got the Bible now. So, you know, God is not speaking anymore. We don't need prophecy, which I think is absolutely ludicrous because number one, the majority of things that God said were not doctrinal. The doctrinal things that's laid out doctrine, that laid out how we live and how we do things, those things were provided to Moses in the law. So Moses was one of the few people who got doctrine. But the majority of the things that God, moments in the Bible when God spoke, was God speaking to regular old personal issues that we deal with every day. He spoke to Ahab and, and Jehoshaphat when they weren't sure if they should go to war or not and if they would lose the war. He spoke to uh, uh, Philip to tell Philip, hey, I want you to go to that chariot. There's a man, you know, he told Peter, uh, well, Peter's was sort of doctrinal. It became doctrinal because uh, when he was on the rooftop, and he had the vision of the four sheets let down from the corner, four corners of the, of the sheet let down from the four corners of the earth with the four foot things and all kind of creeping things on it. And God said, rise, keep Peter, kill and eat. When Peter refused that, when that occurred, that was more doctrinal. That was God speaking in a doctrinal way. It was going to set the course of doctrine, open up the gospel to, uh, to allow Jewish people to interact with Gentiles, which was previously not done which is why in the next chapter, over chapter 11, uh, Peter gets in uh, a bit of a squabble because when he comes to the other disciples and they have heard that he'd been in the house of a Gentile, they was ready to string him up. And that was because in their culture, they had been taught according to the law to not deal with the Gentiles. So for him to be in the house of a Gentile was a bit of an offense. So God was changing something that was doctrinal. But again, the majority of the things God spoke were not doctrinal. So again, you have a lot of people. Oh, I'll give you another example. When <clears throat> Abimelech, Abraham comes to town and he's on his way, moving through, going where God told him to go. He becomes afraid when he comes to a certain place because he feels like his wife is so beautiful that she's going to be taken by the king and his life is going to be taken. So he says, look, I want you to say you're my sister. And just as he suspected, they thought that she was beautiful and they took her to be wife. And the whole time she said, this is my sister. And he never said anything about the fact that it was the man's wife. Abimelech, however, <coughs> was a bit of a righteous king. And because of that, God intervened and said to him, you're a dead man. And pretty much was saying, you're a dead man if you sleep with this man's wife. And he said, but he said this was his sister. And so God said, I know, that's why I kept you from sleeping with her, that I might not have to kill you. And so that was not doctrinal. We might use it for doctrine teaching, for teaching or instruction in righteousness, 
But that is not doctrine. God is not speaking to give him doctrine. God is trying to save his life and give him correction and give him a, uh, a reveal to him that the way he's going is not the way that he needs to go. So we have these various groups of people who like to argue with those of us who believe that God still heals and God still speaks and God is still casting out demons. They always have these imbalanced scriptural interpretations that are oftentimes wrong. They make the most silliest statements. And this is the ultimate. I'm listening to this. So I'm listening to my Bible on tape. And I'm listening to Jesus going through healing and doing miracles. And I'm watching this. And it occurs to me that the signs and wonders are confirming Jesus. So much so that when they challenge him one time, he says, go, John says, uh, they send John the Baptist. John the Baptist sends somebody to Jesus and say, are you the one? And he says, tell him that the blind are healed, the lame are, 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 are walking. He says, tell him that all these great miracles will happen. The miracles themselves point to Jesus. So Jesus uses the miracles to point to himself. Then we go to the book of Acts. The book of Acts, the disciples use the miracles to point to Jesus, to, uh, to validate him as the Christ. So the disciples understand that the miracles are there to validate uh, Jesus as Christ. Jesus used the miracles to heal the sick and also to validate that he was Christ. So why having such a very clear and distinct pattern from the founder of our faith, the immediate uh, development, the early uh, developers or founding fathers of the faith, although we like to call the founding fathers them guys in the in the in the in the in the in the, in the, in the, uh, the early churchhood church fathers, we like to, them guys from the Catholic Church. But them ain't the guys who establish our faith. The guys who establish our faith are the ones that Jesus gave the charge to. They are the founding fathers. So if the founding fathers understood this, Jesus understood this, why don't we understand that? Why are we still trying to figure out something that we have such clear evidence of? It's a very clear pattern. Jesus starts it off. The disciples pick up the ball where he left off. And then here we come. We come along. We don't need miracles. We don't need signs. We don't need gifts. We don't need anything. And we are so convinced that we're right. How are you right if Jesus is doing something different than what you are? If he preached with signs following and disciples preach with signs following, then what's wrong with you? So yes, I'm on my soapbox today and I'm going to challenge us. I'm going to challenge us to revisit these issues. We need to get in line with the scriptures. It never amazes me that the people who boast so much about being people who believe the scriptures never believe it all. They don't believe that God is speaking anymore, though they have no scriptural proof. They got some scriptures they use, but those scriptures are not valid. And I'm working on a book right now so that we can resolve this issue. I'm going to take an honest look at the subject because there are people who have been deceived by revelations and religions and, and Christian off sects and cults that have been started by revelations. But I hope, I, you know, I hate to surprise some people, but there were other uh, denominations and cults that were started by simple biblical misinterpretation. Simple as that. And so, you know, we really do have to start looking at the situation seriously and stop kidding ourselves and thinking that somehow we can get away from this. I'm going to keep preaching the voice of God. I'm going to keep preaching the gifts of the spirit. I'm going to keep nagging us. I'm going to be like a nagging voice in your ear. I'm going to keep preaching that Jesus is still a healer and he's still speaking. He's still speaking prophetically. He's still speaking to your needs. 
He still will tell you what's happening with your children. He'll tell you what's happening in your marriage and how to fix it. He'll tell you how to apply the scriptures. He'll tell you how to do the things that you need done. He will heal your body. He will cast out demons and, and show you things and visions and dreams. It's just, that's just the truth. So people who, you know, again, hop on how they believe these things can never justify these things in the scriptures and want to argue with those of us that can. But I'm going to leave it right here because the reality is I have the scriptures on my side. I can argue them with anybody and with great ease, might I add, great ease, wouldn't even be a challenge. I can argue them with ease because you cannot argue with things that are true. And the Bible lays out such a clear pattern for us that Jesus had a ministry of signs and wonders that validated who he was. He passed that responsibility off to the disciples. We were supposed to pick up the baton and we dropped it. It's time to pick up your baton again. Get yourself in a class. Get Look at some videos. Learn about healing. Learn about the gifts. Go to 1 Corinthians 12. It's amazing to me that I know Christians who know the Bible back and forth, but ain't never read 1 Corinthians 12. That's amazing to me. But I have met plenty of them who've never heard of the gifts. Never heard of the gifts. So I'm challenging you. Study 1 Corinthians 12. Become familiar with 1 Corinthians 12. Study the gifts of the Spirit. Get in some classes, get some courses, get some CDs, books, whatever you got to do, and learn about the gifts, how to operate in the gifts. They are good today. They are valid today. And don't let anybody tell you any different.